Thank you. Thank I was really good for myself, Christine. Thank you, everybody, uh, for, for coming along this evening in person and online for Tales of the Oak, which is a sort of a, a pick and mix of the more unusual stories from here in Inverclyde. I'm Paul Bristol, and over the last couple of months, I've been in and out all around the houses, here, there, and everywhere, working with young people here in the Beacon, uh, with schools, with libraries, and online, to look at some of the folk tales and fables from the area and then reinterpret them and retell them. And while I've been doing that, what's been happening is the young people involved have been recording themselves, telling these stories. Loads and loads of folk have been involved in recording themselves. And I'm going to share those with you this evening on the big screen, along with some uh, special illustrations that have been put together just for the occasion. Now, I've been telling stories about Inverclyde for almost a quarter of a century. I really felt there should have been more of a gasp there. I, I, I know what you're thinking. Uh, I, I, uh, I must have started awful young. Yes, you're absolutely right. I did. I did start very young. And one moment sticks out for me in particular, and that's that there's a set of old steps, right, that runs from Prospect Hill Street down to the scheme where I grew up, down in, in Roxburgh Avenue. And it's one of those bits where, like, the old town and the new town, they sort of bash into one another a wee bit. They sort of fold over. And I used to run up and down these steps every day on the way to school. My school was St. Patrick's Primary, right at the very top of the hill. And on the way down the steps, right, you got an amazing view into the back of this old scabby garage that was there. And the garage would quite often chuck scrapped cars out the back. And you could see them as you were coming down the stairs and know that you could go and play in them on the way home. And behind that, behind the, the scrapped cars, there was a, a big steel door under the steps, always all bolted, locked up. And I imagined that it was like a cupboard under the stairs for the garage, you know, full of car parts and paint and all that sort of stuff. But then one day, when I was walking up to school, I noticed that the door was open. There'd been a big storm the night before and it just blown in. And there was nobody around to give me into trouble. So I decided that I was going to go and look at what was behind the door. And as I walked towards it, I heard this huge roaring noise. And as I, as I got to the entrance, I figured out what it was. It's water. Because it wasn't a cupboard under the stairs. It was a tunnel, a cave almost. The water poured in from the left around this big bend. And then I way down again to the right where I couldn't see it. And between these two points, jutting out over them, there was like a wee wet step just in front of the door. Now, I realise now that what I was looking at was probably a culvert, sort of guiding the water down from the hills and into the river. But see, at that moment, it was a total revelation because this was it. This was the proof that there were secret doors passageways, tunnels under the town, and I'd found one. I'd found a way to get into that other world. I wasn't daft, though, because I couldn't swim. And so I knew that if I sort of skidded off that wee wet step, I'd have been washed away like Moses in his wee basket. So I just came close enough, as far as I dared, just to listen to the sound of the water as it roared round the cave. And eventually I realised I better get to school. And I was late for school that day. Sister Mary Anthony, the head teacher, she wasn't pleased. Um, but then she wasn't pleased about anything, so that didn't really matter. <laughs> and uh, the whole day, I just sat there, just thinking about it, thinking about the door and how I was going to go again and look at it on the way home. And of course, when I got there, the door was closed. And I never, ever saw it opened again. But from that day forward, see, whenever I walked down the stairs, I could hear the water. I could feel it as it rushed away out to the river and then on to sea. And since then, since that day, I've come a bit better at spotting those sorts of doors, those sorts of places, you know, forgotten roads or, or side streets that seem to take you one way but lead you another. And if I'm having a particularly lucky Tuesday or it's just the right kind of evening, now and again, occasionally, out the corner of my eye, I'll glimpse some of the magical folk that live in this particular area. Now, I know what you're thinking, because when I tell people that, they give me a bit of a, a, bit of a funny look, a bit like 
the look that you're giving me just now. And they say, Polly, are you all right? Are you, are you maybe not just seeing things that aren't there? But I say to you, maybe you're not looking hard enough at the things that are there. And I understand, though, I do, because it's easy done. We all do it. All those places that we walk past every day on the way to school or, or the shops or your work, we sort of fade into the background. We stop noticing them. It's just like wallpaper, really. But these places, our places, can be just as amazing and magical as the places that we read about in books or hear about in stories. You just got to dig a bit deeper, look a bit harder. And I've been really lucky because over the last few years, that's exactly what I've been able to do. And what I started doing was imagining a, a wee map in my head of where all these stories were. Help me keep track of them. And also in case one of them disappeared, because you know how stories, they can be like that a wee bit. They're on the tip of your tongue and then, and then they're gone. So I'm going to share my map with you tonight. And when you see it, you'll no doubt recognise some places that you know. But there'll be places on there that you know that I don't know. So after the end of the evening, maybe you could come and tell me where to go in a nice way, you know. So before I share that map with you, let's, uh, let's look at a real map, right? So I'm here, right, up the Gibby, right in the middle of the town between... Deenock and Port Glasgow, and it has, without question, the best view in the town, because out my window, away over on the right, I can see Dumbarton Rock, where Merlin spent quite a wee bit of time a few centuries back, and then away over on the left, I can see Dunrod Hill, where our own wizard spent a bit of time casting spells, and in the middle, in between the town, the river, and all its stories. So this is my map here, because that map, when I look at it, I think, well, they've left off the Mermaid Cove, or they haven't put the best place to stand and see UFOs, the important stuff, the stuff that people really need to know, right? So I would urge you all right to put away your Google Maps, and you can, for the next wee while, anyway, follow me away down the wrong road. And I can't guarantee that I'm going to get you where you're going, but hopefully you won't forget where you've been, right? And if we were going to start our story and start our journey. The best place, of course, is to start where we are. So if we were all to go out onto the riverside right now, we're not going to do that. Everybody's only just sat down. But if we were to do that, got up and outside onto the riverside, we'd see the, the river and the boats for sure. And we'd see the lights flashing on the boys. But there's a whole lot of stuff that we wouldn't see. The, the secrets that are hidden in the river. And that's what these first two stories tonight are all about. There were two sisters who found a home in the Clyde, Marina and Harborina. Marina, with the most beautiful crimson red tail, loved to venture close to the land. One of her ventures led her to meet a striking, handsome baron, the Baron of Newark. Conjuring up the last of her mermaid magic, she transformed herself into a human to be with the Baron, not heeding the warnings of her sister Harborina. After a year of what she thought was love and bliss, the Baron struck her a finishing blow. Her spirit was bound forever to the castle. Harborina, lost with no structure to her life, stayed by the shore near her sister's castle to remain near her. Many years passed before she found her calling, giving foresight and guidance to the people of Inverclyde. And Inverclyde really did need some guidance. That's how the shore came to be occupied by the two aquatic sisters. The ghostly marina trapped in the castle. And the wise mermaid harborina by the shore. Once there were three witches who left their home country and stowed away on a sugar boat. Before long they realised that the crew of the boat was smuggling treasure alongside the sugar. Not long before the ship reached land, the witches were discovered by the crew who wanted to make sure that they would never tell anyone about the treasure on the boat. Realising they were in danger, the witches called down a storm to sink the boat. They used the sugar and the river water to craft one final potion that would keep them safe. 
the crew on the riches disappeared, the sugar melted away and the water making this clay the sweetest river in the world. The, the boat stayed sunk in the river and from time to time stories were still told about the hidden treasure. And treasure hunters would dive down into the wreck to try their luck. But there's no luck to be found in the sugar boat, only darkness. That's lovely. I, I wasn't sure if we were going to do that. Let's keep doing that. That's good, right? Okay, so, um, yes, the sweetest river in the world. Please uh, don't drink any of the water to test that theory. Just take my word for it. I can't be held responsible for anything that might happen if you drink the water. And some witch stories there then. And there, well, there are quite a few witch stories associated with the area. Most of them quite sad, terrible stories. The most famous magical character, though, that we have in the area is Aldunrod. Uh, the warlock that I mentioned earlier. So who is Old Dunrod? Well, he, he's a landowner from down in Burkip Way. You know how they're all minted down there. And um, the landowner, well, it wasn't going so well for him. He was, he was rooked. He was, he was down on his luck. And he decided that the best way to sort this out was that he was going to start stealing the milk from the neighbouring farms. But he didn't steal the milk by getting up, like, extra early in the morning and going and milking the cows. And he didn't assemble like a team of dairy bandits to steal the cows. No, he decided that the best way to get the milk was to use magic. And that's maybe where it started to go a wee bit wrong for him because he wasn't the best wizard in the world. He was okay, but he wasn't the best. And this ballad that was written in the, in the 17th century tells you a wee bit of some of the, the escapades that he got up to. And I'm going to read the ballad for you now. It's in Scots and there's some artwork on the screen to accompany it. All Dunrod was a gousty carl, as ever you may see. And again, he wasn't a warlock wich, there was nane in the hail country. All Dunrod, he stack a pin, a bootry pin, in the wall. And whenever he wanted his neighbour's milk, he just gied the pin a throw. He milk it the laird of Kelly's kai, and all the kai of the noon. And all Dunrod get far mere milk than would make a gabbard swim. The cheese he made were numerous and wondrous to descry, for the kit it had gin as if it had been gruel or peats set out to dry. And there was nae comer old man about what came to him for skill, that gif he didn't do them good, well, he didn't do them ill. But the cock got word of Dunrod's tricks, and the session he took him hand, and nothing was left but old Dunrod, for Soothmon, leave the land. See old Dunrod, he munted his stick, his broomstick munted he, and he flickered two or three times about and signed through the air, did flee. And he flew away by the Greenock Tower and by the Newark Hall. You wouldn't have kenned the man's flicked, be a buddock or a craw. And he flew to the rest to be thanked for staying. A merry old carl was he. He stought it and fluff it as if he'd been wood or drunken by the barley brie. But a round tree grew at the stain, it's there, and to this day, and if you didn't see it still set down, that's away. And he ne'er wished to the round tree, till he came bunt thereon, his magic broomstick tint its spell, and he dot it on the stone. Now his heed was hard, and the stain was say, and when they met in another, it was hard to tell what would be the weird, of either the tain or the tither. But the stain was more like a lamp at shell. So was old Dunrod. When you munt a broomstick to take a flick, you best take another road. And their neighbours gathered to see the sicht. The stain's remains they saw. But as for old Dunrod himself, he was carried clean of all. And money night as well they micht, the rest be thanked for stain. And Ilkane said, been better still, Gindan Rod had stayed at home. And what became of Old Dunrod was Dutfa for to say. Some said he wasn't there at all, but flew another way. So that's the ballad of Old Dunrod there. And also, I think, a very useful lesson in how we get our dairy produce. Maybe don't be like Old Dunrod. You know, maybe stick to the oat milk the soya, that kind of thing, it's better for the environment anyway. And it was Inverkip 
where Dunrod originally cast all his spells and caused all his trouble. And Inverkip was one of the earliest settlements in the area. The, the first uh, Church of the Kirk was there. And of course now, there's a, there's a beautiful big marina down there with all the fancy ships and all that. But back in the day, it would have been this same bay that the smugglers would turn up at, bringing in their illegal goods into the area. Now, of course, nothing like that happens anymore. But there are folk who say that there's maybe things hidden away up in the hills and the smugglers' caves around the town. And that's just one of the stories that I was told when I went down to chat with the young people of Inverkit Primary School. Not so long ago, Inverkit village was full of smugglers. And many believe that there's still treasure or other loot hidden somewhere near in the town, perhaps in the old smugglers' cave. But anyone who dares to trespass in the cave may not like what they find, for the smugglers left traps, curses and guardians to protect their loot. Eek! Arrgh! Arrgh! Centuries now it's been, been hidden safely away, away, but perhaps you'll be the one to find it. Perhaps. At the back of the playground, there's an old gate. Behind the gate, there's an old tree that used to be a witch. She stretches out her branches down towards the gate, and every year the children dare themselves to reach out and touch the witch's finger. Everyone laughs nervously, not quite trying too hard to reach, but every so often, Someone wakes the witch. And the game is over for another year. Don't feel too embarrassed though if you haven't heard of him, right? Because he's a bit of a rubbish pirate. So some people say he's from Greenock, other people say he's from Dundee. Really doesn't matter where he's from because he's, he's rubbish either way. But he did do one really good thing which is that eventually, after a long time, he managed to get his hands on some treasure. And him and the crew are sailing as fast as they can, but they're being pursued by the British Navy, who have got much better ships, and they're going to catch them. And the pirates know that they're going to catch them. And so Kid and a couple of the boys, they row ashore, they dig a big hole, and they chuck the treasure in, and they say, well, we'll be back to get that later. Except they get caught, and they don't ever get back to get the treasure. And so, Kid was the first pirate to bury treasure, and the stories around it became very popular very quickly, creating this sort of mystery. And it inspired Robert Louis Stevenson when he came to write his book, Treasure Island. So if Kid only managed to do that, I would say, that's, that's pretty good going, that's a bit of a win. But he also inspired a, a popular sea shanty, which uh, you know, was, was played a lot in the pubs and taverns around London after his death. And this is a, a new recording of the shanty that was made for us for tonight. My name was William Kidd when I sailed, when I sailed. My name was William Kidd when I sailed. My name was William Kidd, God saws I did forbid. So wickedly I did when I sailed I murdered William Moore as I sailed, as I sailed I murdered William Moore as I sailed I murdered William Moore, I laid him in his gore Not many leagues from shore as I sailed I thought I was undone as I said. I thought I was undone, and my wicked glass had run. But help would soon return as I 
Captain Kidd, a pirate in spite of himself, he said. Now, when I was out chatting to folk and doing the work and, and having a wee blether with people, I wasn't really looking for scary stories or spooky stories, but it's the time of year, isn't it? The night's drawing in, and up in the air, all that. So there were a few um, ghost stories, and, and I was really surprised to read a couple of weeks back, in fact, that in the Greenock Telegraph, it said that Inverclyde is one of the most haunted places in the UK. That wasn't even the weirdest story I, in the telly that night, obviously. But <laughs> that's remarkable, isn't it? The most, one of the most haunted places in the UK. I mean, that must mean that we're walking past ghosts all the time without really noticing them. Statistically, the chances are there's a ghost in the audience right now, maybe, maybe in that seat up there. And, and that's okay, I could use the numbers, that's fine, right? But, in fact, you, you, Beacon can maybe correct me if I'm wrong here, but I do think all theatres are legally obliged to have a ghost anyway. That's, that's just part of the deal. And ghosts, well, they become associated with buildings, don't they? they? They become attached to places. And that's what these next two stories are about. Two very different ghosts uh, in two very different buildings. The youth club sat on the dark and derelict streets of the town centre, but a particular evening was foggy and the bus headlights emphasised the thickness of the fog at the empty bus stops. As Elle stepped off the bus to make her way into the youthy to prepare the halls for next day events, she felt an instant chill. She couldn't quite put her finger on it, but something did just did not feel right. As Elle entered the building, she felt a brush of air pass her. She felt sure someone was watching her. There was a loud bang as the door slammed. She knew whatever was in here was not human and that it had been waiting for her. Oh my God. We visited a castle on our school trip. It was hundreds of years old. Some people say the castle is haunted by the spirit of a grey lady. But the teacher said it's probably not true. She was just not paying attention. Neither were any of other people's. We could see her though, we could hear her. So we waited behind when everyone went home and followed the distant wails and screams up the old stairs to the top of the castle. She was young, sad and lonely, and she just wanted some company. So now we visit her all the time. Her name is Margaret, but we call her Maggie. There's, there's actually two grey ladies in the town at completely different buildings. Um, we'll hear a wee bit about one of the other ones. Um, later on. The first story there though, the, the ghost in the youth club, uh, particularly fascinates me because the young people who, who were telling me that story, there was some actual footage of uh, the alleged supernatural events that happened in there. And that building originally, well it was like an old post office. And so, you know, wh who was that ghost? Is it just somebody coming in for their work and being really annoyed that there's a pool table there now? Or, or you know, what, what is it? And I'm not, I'm not really sure that I believe in ghosts. 
but I don't need to to enjoy a good ghost story. But I do wonder about ghosts in buildings, like what happens to them when the buildings are knocked down? Do they, do they just disappear altogether or, or do, they, do they drift out onto the streets? Maybe that's why Inverclyde's one of the most haunted places in the UK. Who knows, who knows, certainly not I. So let's, let's take a, a wee step back from the supernatural, right? And now we're going to have a wee look at the natural world, right? And about a local wildlife. Although, to be fair, maybe not the sort of local wildlife that you would enjoy seeing when you're out for a wee walk on your own. In the dead of winter, there's something slithering slowly through the silent streets that will make your blood run cold. Don't open your door, watch out when recycling, and always check the toilet before you sit down. It's hanging from the school! Not on my watch. Follow me! <laughs> Looks like we got them. Aye, as far as we know. As far as we know. They say that once, long ago, there was a monster in the river. And during the Second World War, it washed up on the Greenock Shore, dead. Ew. Not wanting any panic, the creature was quickly taken from the shore and buried under a football pitch. And that should have been that. But some believe that, that the river monster returned as a ghost. As it wanders through the streets, all it wants is to return to the river. To find peace beneath the waves. There's a big cat roams the hills above the town. Some say it was once a witch's cat, or that it escaped from an old zoo. Others say it was an evil demon or sorcerer, trapped in the form of a cat during a magical battle. One thing's for sure though, whatever it was, the sheep were terrified. Hunters searched for it, tried to trap it, but nothing worked. So, it's still out there, hiding on the hills, waiting to pounce. That first story, do, do people remember hearing that, the snakes at the start of the year? The first story was, was is, and in truth, it's actually quite sad because, you know, the, these snakes uh, escaped or were lost or whatever at the, the sort of darkest, coldest point of the long winter that we had at the start of the year. And um, I'll tell you what was odd, how many people when I was out wanted to talk about that story or would share that story as an example of something weird that had happened. It's well on its way to becoming a sort of a local legend, I would say. And it reminded me that as individuals, we don't get to decide what stories the community keep telling. You know, the community makes its decision about what stories are important and keeps telling them, keeps sharing them. But I tell you something odd about that snake story. So the school that they were found nearby was St. Patrick's Primary School, my old primary school that I mentioned earlier, although it's a nice big shiny version of St. Patrick's now, a new, new build. And um, it's in the same place though, right at the top of the hill. And when I was at school, and I'm sure it's the same now, right? All the pupils would have been told the legends and stories of St. Patrick, their patron saint, including the one about how he managed to get rid of all the snakes in Ireland. So of all the places for the snakes to turn up, it was, it was a really unlucky call, wasn't it? I mean, like, that, what were the odds? They would have been better off in St. Francis up the port. <laughs> so I know the audience now, because if you don't know St. Francis, he's, um, he's, the, he's the saint that likes animals, right? So you don't, you don't go to St. Patrick's Primary for seven years and not know the stories of the saints, because it wasn't allowed. Um, so the, the, on, a, on a related note, I suppose, it's nearly Christmas. 
And um, I'm one of those people who, who quite likes reminding people of that at regular opportunities, you know, like, oh, it's, it's actually, it's only 58 days, that kind of thing. And I, I do know that Christmas isn't like that for everybody and, and that people celebrate it for different reasons. And um, for me, it's, I'm not a religious person, so it's not about that. It's, it's not about the presents, although obviously people are welcome to buy them for me. It's, it's, um, it's more about the fact that at that dark point of the year, you, as far as you can, as possibly as you can, you, you spend time with the people that are most important to you as the, as the light returns. I love all that. I love that kind of feeling of hunkering down. And if you're wondering just now, what would be a good gift to give to people for your winter celebrations? Well, stories are a good gift. And I don't mean ones you get from me. I mean, ones you make yourself. That's the kind of gift that people like, isn't it? Those ones that we make for one another. And it's nice to make them, it's nice to get them. And this next story is a story about a gift like that. And it's called The Silver Snowflake. So there was a boy, a good boy, but a poor boy. And with winter celebrations approaching, he had no gift for his mum and he had no way to buy her one. And so he went up to the hills behind the town. And he just watched the snow falling for a wee while onto the streets below. And he held out his hand as the snow was falling. And a snowflake landed right in the palm of his hand. And it didn't melt. And he looked at it for a wee minute because he thought, well, maybe my hand's just so cold that it's not going to melt. But that wasn't it. It still didn't melt. So he, he picked it up between his thumb and his forefinger and he looked at it. It felt like steel. And that's when he got his idea. He thought, ah, I could give this to my mum as a gift if I get somebody to hang it on a chain for me. And so he went down to the shipyards to speak to McCausland the welder. And McCausland said, oh, I like your snowflake there, wee man. That looks really nice. I love how it doesn't melt. And of course, no bother. I can hang that on a chain for you. That'll be one gold coin. And the boy said, well, I... I don't actually have any money, but I can work. Is there, is there anything that I can do for you? And McCausland said, well, truth be told, we're, we're actually a wee bit behind with some ships at the moment, but what, what would be really helpful, right, is if you could go up to the mines at the back of the town and go and find Dempster, the dwarf, because he's got a magic hammer. And if he gave me that hammer, I would be able to get these ships finished double quick, and then I could make a chain for your snowflake. Magic hammer. I'm on it. And off he went, up the hill, and then down into the mines and all through the tunnels and caves until he finally got to the armory where he found Dempster, the dwarf, sharpening his axe. And he, he said, uh, Hello, Dempster, I've just been speaking to McCausland, the welder, down at the shipyards, and he was wondering if he could have a wee loan of your magic hammer. Oh, I bet he was, said the dwarf. And why would I give him that? What am I going to get in return? for a loan of this magic hammer? Well, probably nothing from McCausland to the boy, but I can help you. Is there, is there anything I can do? I know my way around an armory. No, no, said Dempster. I've got no need for a page boy or any of that nonsense at all. But I tell you, do you see that treasure chest in the corner of the room there? That was given to me by my grandfather. And the key for it that's locked it was stolen by a mermaid. If you get me the key back, I'll give you the hammer. All right, I'm on it, said the boy. And he ran through the mines, up, out of the hill, down to the edge of the river, but not right up to the edge of the river because he'd heard that some mermaids quite like to pull wee people down into the dark depths. What are you wanting, said the mermaid. Well, said the boy, I was just in the mines there talking to Dempster and he was wondering if he could have that key back that you stole off him. And why would I want to give him the key back? Said the mermaid, sort of waving it at him. Well, said the boy, come a wee bit closer, she said. I can't hear you properly. No, you're all right, said the boy. I'll just stay here if it's all the same with you. Clever boy, said the mermaid. I tell you what, I tell you what. I used to have a song and I would sing it all the time. I sang it beautifully. And all the boys and girls would come right up to the edge of the water to hear me singing my song. If you could get my song back for me, then I'll give you the key. 
the grey lady stole my song. And I don't know why, because she's got a terrible singing voice. But if you get it back, then I'll give you the key. Song, said the boy. Righto. And he headed away down the coast to the castle right at the edge of the town. And he waited until it was night time. And sure enough, right then, the grey lady appeared at the window and started shrieking and howling and carrying on. And the boy waited until he was, he was pretty sure she'd finished. And he said, hello, grey lady. What, what a beautiful song. That was lovely. Listen, I've just been speaking to the mermaid. She was wondering if you've maybe finished with that song and she could have it back. I most certainly have not finished with it, said the grey lady. Did you not just hear me singing it? How brilliant I sounded. She shrieked a wee bit more just to prove her point. Yeah, that, that is lovely, said the boy, but to be honest with you, you sound a wee bit like you're getting tired of it. Why, why don't I trade you for something? Is there something you want? Oh, now here, said the grey lady, I tell you what I miss. I only get to come out at night now, you see, and I used to love the sun. I used to love looking at the sun and being in the sunshine. If there's a way you can fix it for me to be in the sun, then I'll give you the song. Okay, said the boy, and he, he ran east, right to the edge of the horizon. It took him ages, and by the time he got there, the sun was just coming up. Good morning, said the boy. Hello, said the sun. What are you doing here? Well, I've got a friend who would really like to see you, but she only gets to come out at night. Is there any way we can make that work, that she gets to see the sun at night? And the sun said, well, no, I, I, I don't get to come out at night. It's not allowed, although... You know, it didn't used to always be like that. Back, oh, centuries ago, me and the moon could be up dancing in the sky at the same time. I miss the moon. In fact, if you could move the moon, then it would be nighttime and daytime at the same time, wouldn't it? And your friend would be able to see me. Move the moon, said the boy. You want, you want me to move the moon? I said the sun. How would I move the moon? Oh, you'd need a moon witch for that. Right, said the boy, and he rushed back to the town and up a different hill, the Crow Mount, where he knew all the witches lived. And he got to the top of the Crow Mount, and there was only one witch there. And he said to her, where's all the other witches? And she said, oh, all my sisters have passed on this last year. It's just me now, me and the moon. Well, I'm awful sorry to hear that, said the boy, but, but talking to the moon, is there any chance... You could do me a wee favour and maybe move the moon for me. Oh, no, no, said the, said the moon witch. I'm not the strength for that now. I'm, I'm just too tired and sad after the year it's been. I will understand that, said the boy. But, you know, they do say that laughter's the best medicine. So if I could make you laugh, would you move the moon for me? I'd do anything to laugh again, said the moon witch. Anything at all. We've got a deal then, said the boy, and he ran down into the valley because he knew that down there, there was an old joke that hadn't been heard for a long time. And he said to the old joke, I know somebody who would love to hear from you. And the old joke was delighted. And he ran back to the moon witch and he said, why wouldn't the lobster share her toys? And the moon witch said, I don't know. Why wouldn't the lobster share her toys? Because she was shellfish. I mean, the moon, like, the moon she laughed a lot more than that, right? She laughed, but, it, but, it, but it had been a while since she'd heard the joke, right? She laughed. She loved it. And then, when she'd finished laughing, she moved the moon. And the sun asked the moon for a dance, and they swirled around the sky. And the grey lady saw the sun in the sky and enjoyed that, gave the boy the song. And the boy took the song to the mermaid and gave it back. And she sang it beautifully and then gave the boy the key. And the boy took the key, ran away back down into the mines and gave it to Dempster, who unlocked the treasure chest. And inside was a picture of his grandmother who made him smile and cry. And he gave the magic hammer to the boy and he took it all the way down to the shipyard and gave it to McCausland, who used it to make a chain for the snowflake. And the boy gave the snowflake to his mother for the winter celebrations. And she loved it. And in time... She gave it to his daughter, who gave it to her son, who gave it to his daughter. And all the way down the centuries, the snowflake never melted.
when would it end? Do you thought when would it end? So uh, now I called tonight's collection of stories Tales of the Oak because I thought that, that some people uh, maybe knew the story of the old green oak tree that would, that would grow in the middle of the town. That's how Greenock got its name. Probably not. Another story is that Greenock means sunny bay in Gaelic, uh, as a wee joke, presumably, because obviously we only get uh, 11 days of sunshine here. But actually, I was thinking about this, and you know, it is sunnier now. Certainly warmer now. It's more sunny days than when I was young. And the rainy days, well, they're rainier as well, aren't they? And, you know, there's a big moat ends up around the town. You can't drive in or out. We're flooded. And so, like everywhere else, we're now having to start to think about how the climate emergency affects how we live and work in a place. And when we talk about the climate emergency, often, you know, it's quite doom and gloom. You, you feel overwhelmed. You don't know how you can help or, or what you can do. And you end up feeling really anxious, just frozen like a, a rabbit in the headlights or a, or a ghost without a house to haunt. But what if it wasn't like that? What if instead of it all going wrong, what if we fixed it? What if things worked out for the best? What if even in a wee place like this, we found a way to do things differently and better? So this is a story not from long ago, but from maybe a wee bit further down the road. And all of tonight's stories um, have had words you might have noticed so far. But this final story for the evening is a wee bit different because not every story needs words.
So back, back to the map now, and you'll notice the eagle-eyed amongst you will have noticed that I haven't mentioned, you know, even half the things on this map. That's not because I've forgotten, I don't think, um, but it's more because I would invite you to have a look at this, you know, later on, and then and think about the bits that interest you, and, and then you go and find out a wee bit about those stories. You, you know, do a wee bit of digging, see if you can find it out for yourself. I can't hand everything to you on a plate. I've been, been up here all night telling you stories, right? So maybe, maybe your turn to, to sort of go out there, and that's how we keep these stories being told. However, I couldn't end the evening without just very briefly paying a, a bit of a tribute to folk hero, urban legend, uh, YouTube sensation, the Greenock Catman, who I'm assuming most of you will have heard of. And certainly, while I was out and about, his name came up quite a lot. His name always comes up quite a lot. And lots of people, when I was talking, well, they thought he was a story. And of course, he is a story. But he's a true story. He's a real story. And I, I, as I was telling some of the groups, I met him. I met him. And hand on heart, I saw the Catman. And that's because when, um, when, I, was, when I was wee, when I was growing up, uh, my my mum and my brother and I would walk to my grand's house in the East End of Greenock every Saturday and she lived in one of the high flats in Belleville Street and we would walk along uh, Scotts Lane, a wee cobbled street which isn't much wider than about this here, a wee cobbled street and it's got a fence running down one side of it and there's all barbed wire around the top of it and when you get about halfway along behind the barbed wire fence there's a big concrete tube and in the tube that's where the cat man slept and he was just an old guy who used to feed all the stray cats in the town and they would sort of gather around him. Maybe they kept him warm, I don't know. And everybody knew him. And we'd walk past and just say, hello, cat man. And he would say, hello, back. And that was it. Just, just an old guy. And then, well, then one day he wasn't there anymore. And everybody thought, oh dear, I hope the cat man's okay. I hope everything's fine with him. Maybe he's found somewhere else to be. But everybody still talked about him. We still remembered him. And then, about five years ago, maybe more, a group of young people, walking along the old cobbled street, got about halfway along the barbed wire fence and the concrete tube, and in the concrete tube, there was the cat man. And of course, everybody's got a mobile now, so they just took them out, chuk, 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 lots of photos, films, shared them all around the town. Within about two hours, everybody in the town had seen them, right? And I got one of these photos, I got one sent to him, and I looked at it, and he looked exactly the same. He looked exactly the same as he did when I was growing up. But what are the chances, really, of that being the same old guy almost 40 years later? Pretty slim, but we don't know for sure. And see the stories where we don't know for sure. Those are the stories that I like best because, you know, there's plenty of stories with facts and figures and numbers and all that sort of stuff, if that's what you're interested in. And I kind of feel sometimes that here in our place in Inverclyde, we maybe spend a bit too much time telling ourselves the same stories over and over. James Watt, shipyards, sugar, industry, decline, how wonderful the generation is. All of those things over and over again, round and round, stuck in a loop. And history is important. Of course it is. It can help you understand how things are. But it's not more important than right now. There's folk that will tell you that to know where you're going, you've got to understand where you've been. Looking over your shoulder the whole time, like there's ghosts following you. But you walk around looking over your shoulder all the time, you're apt to end up walking in circles, stuck in a loop, lost in the woods. And then before you know it, you've lost the plot altogether. A bit like myself. So this seems like as good a point as any, I think, for me to wrap up for the evening, so to speak. But I've got a wee bit of homework for you, which I'm going to tell you about in a moment. Before you go, though, I want to remind everyone who's here to be sure to, to pick up your once printed, never reprinted copy of the Tales of the Oak comic that we all wrote, wrote together. And you can uh, take that away. And look, there's a map inside which you can scribble your own places onto. That's what it's for. You're meant to draw on it, right? And if you're watching on the live stream, then there'll be a wee link at the end for you to go and download a copy of the book as well. And of course, a big, big thank you to all of the people who've been involved in this project. So although it's just been me standing here like a dafty for most of the evening, as you'll no doubt have been able to tell, there's been loads of folk helping out with the artwork, with the music and all these sorts of things. And 
A special thanks uh, to the Beacon Arts Centre for hosting us and, and uh, helping us along. And uh, Ian up in the booth there for, for helping us out a lot today. And to Trax, Traditional Arts and Culture Scotland, who funded the whole project and made it happen. But I was particularly delighted to see so many of the storytellers who helped put the stories together come along tonight. So I think a big round of applause for you guys. You are awesome. Right, so here's your homework, okay? So tonight, tomorrow, no later than Saturday, right? I want you to get a, a bit of paper and a pencil, and I want you to draw a map. And it can be a map of anywhere you like. It can be a map of where you grew up. It can be a map of the favourite place that you go to play. It can be a map of the road to your grand's house. It doesn't matter. It just needs to be somewhere that's important to you. And take your time over it. And be sure to mark in all the wee places that make it special to you, the, the sweet shop that you like to go to and what your favourite sweets are, the bit of the field where you used to play a particular game and what the game was. All of these wee things, add them all in. Because you've got plenty of time, you're not in a hurry, right? Take your time. And then, what I want you to do is I want you to show that map to someone else and tell them your stories and ask them to tell you theirs just as you've been kind enough to listen to me this evening. And for that, I thank you. And thank you very much for coming along. Good night. <laughs>